Good morning. Good morning. Sugar, tell them who we are. <laughs> We're Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Bible Study. This is where we get our whole Bible back from cover to cover. Kiver to kiver, the <laughs> old preacher said. And yeah. today we are studying Exodus 21. Are we exempt from Old Testament law in the day of grace? In this chapter, we see Moses instructing the elders how to apply the Ten Commandments to everyday situations. Unfortunately, there is very little evidence that these instructions were ever carried out other in, than in the most perfunctory way. And then in Jesus' day, it was used in harshness for reasons of avarice and greed to, to abuse the people. What about the day we live in? To what degree is the law incumbent upon the New Testament believer? What commands should we take at face value? And what commands are we exempt from and who decides? I don't know about you. I like my ham sandwiches. <laughs> so bacon there's going to be bacon in heaven, folks, or it wouldn't be heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Exodus 21, if you'd read the entire chapter, please. Okay. Now, these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh year he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. And if his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door and unto the doorpost. And his master's master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Now, when Paul described himself as a bond servant, that's what a bond servant was. Mm -hmm. According to the law, servants went free, slaves actually, slaves, went free every six years, unless he would take an awl and pierce his ear and nail it to the doorpost and put a hole in it. If they would see that mark, probably maybe put something in there, mm -hmm. it meant they were a bond servant. They didn't want to ever go free. Why? Because the servant loved his master. master. Bond servants of Christ. Amen. Verse 7. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maid servant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing that hath been, he has dealt deceitfully with her. Because if they hadn't said that, they would get some cute young thing buy her as a slave, have her for six years, I'm tired of you, see you later. Mm -hmm. And then he'd get somebody else for six years. Said he's, he knows what, you got to read between the lines, the Lord knows what they think and what they would try and get around some things. He's saying, you're not going to do this. Verse 9, and if he have betrothed her to, unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. And if he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage, shall he not diminish. So what do you do with that? We have a chapter that is not discouraging polygamy. It's not discouraging slavery. These are things we, we, we totally ignore in the scriptures. And, and what about the fact that Abraham married his sister? We, we need to, inquiring minds want to know, <laughs> this is the word of God. The rule of faith, not saying we're supposed to have multiple wives or slavery yeah. is a godly institution. We're not saying that, mm -hmm. but we just need to make the observations. That is how their culture was. Um, verse 11, and if he do not do these three unto her, then he uh, shall she go out free without money. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him unto his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from 
mine altar that he may die. So first degree, second degree murder was instant death unless you made it to the city of refuge. Yes. But first degree murder, they would take you like, remember Joab went in, grabbed hold of the horns of the altar mm -hmm. and Solomon said, go slay him where he stands. They went and killed him. They're claiming refuge at God's altar because he'd committed first degree murder. Wow. Verse 16. And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. And he that curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. And if men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not, but keepeth his bed, if he rise again and walk abroad, upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. And you think we don't need to talk about he that would steal a man? But I knew a man years ago who his entire life, how he made his living in the Delta, in Mississippi Delta, was to go at, up into the hills and at gunpoint force black families into his truck till he had a truck full and then he would take them down to the delta for cotton picking time and put them in shacks and force them to be sharecroppers till the cotton harvest was brought in he was a man stealer wow. in our day and age uh, verse 20 and if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod and he die under his hand he shall surely be punished Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, and he shall not be punished, for he is his money. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished, according to the woman's husband, will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then shall thou give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot burning for burning, wound for wound, and stripe for stripe. And if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid, that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. And if he smite out his manservant's tooth or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall be surely stoned. And his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. But if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past, and it hath been testified to his owner that he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be mm. put to death. Wow. Because your livestock died. Verse 30. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for... Give the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. Now that would be like somebody had a car accident, but both cars were in working order. There was then there'd just be some reparations. Mm -hmm. But say you had a car accident and your inspection was out, and a mechanic told you your brakes were bad and you killed somebody. Say kill that man where he stands. Wow, pretty harsh. My goodness. Verse thirty one. Whether he have gored a son or have gored a daughter, according to this judgment, shall it be done unto him. If the ox shall push a manservant or maidservant, he shall give unto their master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. And if a man shall open a pit, or if a man shall dig a pit, and not cover it, and an ox or ass fall therein, the owner of the pit shall make it good, and, the, and give the money to the owner of them." And the beast, the dead beast, shall be his. And if one man's ox hurts another's, that he die, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money of it, and the dead ox shall they divide. Or if it be known that the ox is used um, to push time, push in time past, and his owner hath not kept him in, he shall surely pay ox for ox. The dead shall be his own. My goodness. So why is all this necessary? We just got the Ten Commandments in the previous chapter. <laughs> See, how come? What are? How do we understand these commands in light of the Decalogue? God did not put these engraved in stone by his own finger. Mm -hmm. He just gave them orally 
to Moses, and he wrote them down, passed them on to the elders who were making judgments, the ones that Jethro recommended him to. Right. So, back to verse 1, God hands down judgments, as they're called judgments for Moses to deliver to the people. In the previous chapter, of course, we're given commandments. Now we're giving judgments. Uh, these are distinctions of requirement concerning the laws that God imposes upon his people. There are the laws, which are the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, as they're theologically called, and then we have the judgments, and then other places we'll see reference to the statutes. So it's the law, the judgments, and the statutes. The judgments are verdicts, like mandatory minimums, based on how to apply the commandments so that things were not left up to individual interpretation. Well, I just don't think that's what that means. You know, well, we're going to establish that uh, according to how God set things up. Moses handed down the commandments, which he delivered to the elders, again, that he appointed with the suggestion of his father-in-law Jethro. The elders then interpreted those commandments and instructed the Israelites how to apply these commandments in their everyday lives. And then as time passed, the judgments that they made of how to apply the commandments, those judgments then became statutes. Mm -hmm. I would say this is how this has always been handled, and that statute had force of law. So these interpretations or applications are how to act in the light of the Ten Commandments that God handed down. Now, in Jesus' day, the elders still fulfilled this role. When Moses appointed at Jethro's suggestion the 70 elders, mm -hmm. that was the early Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. And it continued on right down to Jesus' day. The thing is, in Jesus' day, this had become corrupted. Therefore, Jesus denounced them. He said, woe unto you, lawyers. Mm -hmm. Now, who's a lawyer? That's the guy that says, scripture, please. You're not a lawyer, are you? God, Jesus put his curse on lawyers. Lawyers cite precedents. For you laid, Jesus said, men with burdens grievous to be born, but you yourselves will not touch those burdens with one of your fingers. Mm. So it has been said, who was it that uh, told God scripture, please? That was me. And God warned me about being a lawyer. <laughs> Just saying. It's been said that we place rules around God's rules so we don't break God's rules. That is the heart and soul of what it means to be a Pharisee. In other words, the unwritten rules. The unwritten rules of church culture. The unwritten rules of uh, that pastors and leaders impose what makes a good little Christian. And most of it has nothing to do with anything God said ever. Mm. Uh, in verses 2 and 3, we have instructions. He starts talking about indentured servitude. An Israelite could sell himself into slavery only for seven years. And then, and again, slavery in the scripture. And there's just no reference to dealing with it in the context that we understand it today. It doesn't approve of slavery, but it's just pointing it out. Uh, an Israelite could sell himself into slavery, but on the seventh year, his master was required to let him go free. Was this ever observed? We do have examples of Hebrew slaves serving Hebrew masters, but we have no case in Scripture of a slave ever being released after seven years. In fact, there is little record that these statutes, as they're being laid out, mm -hmm. were ever observed in Hebrew culture. Mm -hmm. That's why 2 Chronicles 34, 21 says, Great is the wrath of the Lord poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. What about us? We're in the new covenant. We don't have to do any. Just bury the old black lids of death. I've, hear, I've heard him say that. Are we free to just totally ignore them? Just, we'll just do whatever feels right. There are people that teach that. That's been taught since the first century right down to our day. Verses 6 and 7 talks more about slaves and masters. It's obvious, again, that indentured servitude and slavery were common among the Hebrews and in ancient culture. In the New Testament as well, the word bond servant 
or a servant is applied metaphorically to someone who's absolutely devoted to Jesus. They saw themselves, they understood slavery, and the teachers and writers of the New Testament uh, portrayed our relationship to Jesus as that of a slave to a master. Uh, Paul, Timothy, James, Peter, Jude, they all describe themselves as bond servants of Christ. You can look that up in Romans 1 1, Philippians 1 1, James 1 1, 2 Peter 1 1, and Jude verse 1. Today, believers, we should still consider ourselves bond servants or slaves to Christ. Yes, we are sons. He's given us power to become sons. But because we are sons, we've made ourselves his servants because he's not just our Savior, he's our Lord. Mm -hmm. And our allegiance is due to him alone. As bond servants, we renounce other masters, Matthew 6, 24. We give ourselves totally to him. In other words, Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. Either serve the one or you serve the other. Being a bond servant is not drudgery because Jesus said in Matthew eleven thirty 30 that his burden is light. Yeah. You know, uh, think about it. What does it mean to have burden light? It's like... I'd like to hire you on. I'll pay you a good wage and you'll work from 12 to 1 with an hour off for lunch. <laughs> that is yoke easy and burden I'd light. say so. <laughs> we, we have this promise. Now that we've been set free from sin, we are now free to become slaves unto God, to reap the benefit that leads to holiness, that Romans 6.18 tells us. Verse 7, we glimpse God's heart toward gender equality. It starts talking about how women are to be handled in these indentured servitude situations. Even under the Old Covenant. See, the suggestion, you got to realize in that culture, women were nothing more than chattel. I mean, you, you owned your woman and your woman owned nothing. The suggestion of equitable treatment of women in ancient times was an utterly radical suggestion. And for them, they would consider that treat a woman like an equal as social engineering beyond anything they ever knew. Every tradition they were familiar with treated women little differently than just personal property or just livestock. And God's laws then are intervening on behalf of women requiring that they be regarded with respect, justice, and deference. And God would set a man at naught in order to give a woman justice. Mm -hmm. Now, what about interpreting social justice initiatives today regarding gender or race? As advanced as we think we are today, things have little changed. Even among so-called progressives, while they pay lip service to equality and respect, all you have to do is look at the fashions of the day, Dress, modes of conduct, and decorum are rife with the objectification of women. A woman who dresses in a provocative way is doing for one thing is because she knows that by being objectified, she can get what she wants because that's how the world looks at her. Whatever else is coming out of their mouth. You can see an actress complaining that someone groped her, but yet you watch in her filmography and over and over and over, she's doing full frontal nudity, she's doing simulated sex acts, and her whole career is based on objectification of women, and then she complains. And so things have very, very little changed. <clears throat> what is that? It's the spirit of Baal Peor. If you want to know more about what's taking place in our day, go study Baal Peor or you'll learn something. In our, in our day, a man can neglect his appearance. He's not fat. He's portly. <laughs> he's not fat. He's successful. He's not. He can neglect his appearance. He can be overweight. He can be unshaven. You say, he's rustic or earthy. What if a woman didn't shave? Well, she didn't shave her pits. Got up on the runway in New York City with hairy legs and all this. What? You know, if it was Paris, you would get away with that. <laughs> but uh, a woman doing the same things that men do, they will be condemned and scorned because she doesn't look like a runway model. That's right. That's wrong. The church is no different. The church is not immune. We have heard more than once 
of women in the church. Yeah, them old churches. No, I'm talking about cutting edge churches mm -hmm. that think that they are the cutting edge of anything that God is doing. And they have women being rejected from pulpit ministry and rejected from platform presence because they're too overweight. You don't have the body type and the image that we want to portray in our broadcasts. That's despicable. Amen. And they're not worshiping God. They're worshiping Baal Peor. And you need to look that up. Unfortunately, our society teaches girls and women rather than to brook that tendency. What do they do? They use it as leverage or power of manipulation to attain in life. What are you talking about? You don't see, and just talk about the church, you don't see a girl in the church in front of 20,000, an audience of 20,000. She's 400 pounds. She doesn't have good hygiene. She's got a mole on her face that looks like a mouse, and she's not attractive. You don't see people screaming and praising Jesus, but if she's blithe of figure, she's attractive by the world standards, she's wearing her clothes in a certain fit, then man, everybody's having a spiritual experience. Something's wrong. Amen. The pressure on women in our society is intense. Oh, Brother Walden, listen, you don't see men cutting themselves, suffering from anorexia or bulimia. Very little does that happen among boys, but it is very common among women. At the same time, regarding boys and men growing up in an environment where women are the object of lurid attention because of their looks and appearance, what does that do? That drives young boys to gravitate toward feminine values and in reality gives rise to homosexual tendencies in young boys because they know to get attention from the, from the power figures in their life, whether it's their father or whoever it might be, uh, adolescent boys have a need. you got to get this. Adolescent boys have a need for the attention and affection and even the touch of their fathers. I know my father mm -hmm. could never touch me in affection. Man, it just instantly brings tears to me. Sure. You just get overcome. There's something that happens when a dad. And if he's not, and if a boy's not getting that, if boys are neglected, and they see their father giving attention that they want toward women, he subconsciously gravitates toward a feminine persona, and we have homosexuality. And the adverse is true with lesbianism. Verse 24 sums up the scope of justice under the law as this. You couldn't really put it any more succinctly. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth is the demand placed on the old covenant believer. Oh, we're so glad we don't have that today. Yes, we do. In Christ, we have grace. Outside of Christ, we have the law. There are no third options. You're either in Christ or you're under the law, period. And outside of it, that ought to help you to know how you deal with people. What about this? Jesus addressed it in his teachings. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. In Christ, he said, you've heard it say, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, do not resist evil for the one or the one who injures you, because anyone who strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other one also. Are you in Christ? And how come we have Christians suing each other? Is Jesus changing or rejecting the law? No. Excuse me, he's taking us beyond the law. If we're required to have a law in order to show justice or do right, we are already offenders. Mm -hmm. If you have to be told you're already an offender, are you listening? Only lawbreakers need the law. In Christ, the law is not given to keep good order, but to bring us to Christ. And again, we've talked about this already in Galatians, Galatians 3.24. The law was your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. It wasn't to make you a good little Christian. It was to bring you to Christ so that you can be justified, not by adherence to the law, but be justified by faith. We look into the law and we realize we need a Savior. We look into the law and we take our measure and realize we're lost and undone. Mm -hmm. Coming to Christ does not negate the law, but imparts to us the nature of God through the indwelling of Christ, whereby in every instance we're not seeking to do right 
according to the law and meet the mandatory minimums, but to go far beyond and fulfill the law of doing unto others as we would have others to do unto us. That's the law of reciprocity fulfilled. Mm -hmm. The law of reciprocity in terms of mandato mandatory minimums is you reap what you sow, baby. <laughs> so, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that this is good instruction. Jesus, you said, now you're clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. God, this is us getting scrubbed clean. When we study this, we become squeaky clean. Not because we're right all the time, but because we're not. And we need to come to your, to look into this. It's a law of liberty. You're trying to liberate us. Lord, help us to see it and understand it that way in Jesus' name. Amen.